public comment is a chance for the community members to communicate with the board directly and not a question and answer opportunity. Questions posted in public comments are not going to be answered at this meeting. District staff has been asked to take questions posed and provide answers. Multiple FAQs will be forthcoming as well. I will now ask Superintendent Nicholas to read public comments. Although we normally limit public comments to 20 minutes per agenda item, we may go over tonight. Even so, we may not have all comments read aloud. All comments have been given to the board members before this meeting tonight and will be added to tonight's meeting minutes. I have read all the public comments and we, the board, take these comments very seriously. Dr. Nicholas. Nick Lanier, Board President Pombo, trustee, do, trustees Dr. Nicholas, thank you all for, thank you to all of you who have reached out to me regarding the many concerns our teachers have during this difficult time. I really appreciate it. Personally, I desperately want to get back into my classroom. I know that the rest of us feel the same way. We would all love for school to return to normal and to see our students face to face again. Unfortunately, it's not possible to do so safely at this point. The COVID crisis in this country, the state, and this county is rapidly getting worse. As of today, Governor Newsom has placed San Joaquin County under greater restrictions than when LTA and the district staff met last week. If you can't get a haircut in the county, how can you pack students into a classroom? The majority of teachers want to be back in the classroom in August, but there is a growing number who are not comfortable with that. There are dozens of hardworking teachers who are high risk to this virus or have family members who are high risk. While we may want to be back in our classrooms, we are going to stick together to protect our fellow teachers who are vulnerable. The Lammersville Teachers Association would like, all of, would like you all to please adopt full distance learning as our method of instruction to begin the school year. This is not an easy decision to make, but it is a necessary one. Each day, more and more districts are making this decision. Please do not delay the inevitable. Please do not start us off planning to be in our rooms only to have us to reverse course in a few weeks. Please don't make us waste the valuable time we need to plan and prepare for this very challenging year. It will be far better for students and for teachers to begin distance learning and later pivot to the classroom than the other way around. Thank you for your time. We appreciate your efforts in keeping the students and staff of our districts safe. Navi Hire. We would like the kids in classroom for two consecutive days with the remaining days of the week for distance learning. So group A goes to school Monday, Tuesday and does distance learning the rest of the week. Group B goes to school Tuesday or Thursday and Friday, no early release and does distance learning Monday through Wednesday. The classroom can be deep cleaned on Wednesdays before the other group comes in. <coughs> Excuse me. Sarah Steele. Uh, when considering the two hybrid models, I am concerned there won't be sufficient cleaning time between each group. What and when will that look like? What does the intervention prep on Friday look like for the teachers? Regina Leva. It is possible for high school students who selected online learning to still access their elective choices through Canvas. Students, oh, that's a question. Uh, students have emailed asking about this option being available for digital art and photography. Students would be missing out on the Delta College articulation if they could not complete the digital art pathway. It would be a kind of hybrid online option which includes both Edgenuity and Canvas. Lorena Garibay, I believe that kids should be able to return to school. It is not only detrimental for their education but important for their mental health. A Monday through Friday schedule or a model close as possible would be best. I also believe that those that don't feel secure with such measures have the option to solely do distance learning. Thank you. Angel Wrigley, the four to five days a week, half day hybrid schedule is a poor option. Our kids will be exposed four to five days a week. The point of all these precautions are to protect our students and staff. Then why would we give them even more in-person exposure? Next, how can we possibly work even from home while having to take or pick up children midday? 
and how can proper sanitation be completed before the next group of students arrive. I feel the two days a week at home, uh, at school, three days at home hybrid model is a better option. Kids are only exposed two days a week, the rest of the classroom, classwork done at home. And I'm hoping I can still go into the office and earn money for my family a couple of days a week while the kids are at school, at a school a full day. Please reconsider the K-8 half-day hybrid option. Thank you. Julia Ulrich. As a PE teacher, I'm asking that all aspects of our students' learning are considered. I am concerned about how PE and music will be taught with social distancing and sanitation equipment that is typically shared as well as teachers that travel to more than one site. Several of our classes are also scheduled to be doubled up this year, making for extra large numbers of students at one time. I would also like co-curricular and extracurricular activities to be addressed as so many students look forward to checking out a library book, participating in Science Olympiad, or joining a sports team. Chris Olson, I would like to propose an alternative model that I suggest, suggested at the end of the school year and had discussed with Ben. In this model, students would have two periods of virtual learning lecture, or vir virtual instruction lecture with follow-up periods of 60 minutes for teachers to request student attendance for intervention or opportunities for practical activities, i.e. lab, or others for students to be signed up. This could be done via flex time manager. Alternatives such as videos and lab results can be given to those who, are, who do not or cannot attend. The AB schedule is a problem because it does not allow for social distancing for students in full high school, school classrooms. It exposes teachers to far too many students. I don't want to get COVID. Also, I am sure the district doesn't want the workers' comp claims and, and doesn't want the spread that could occur based on those contacts. California does not have this under control, and LUSD does not want to make it worse. Mina Parmar. Can we have a block schedule for 7-8, Monday a.m. period 1, Monday p.m. period 2, Tuesday, period, Tuesday a.m. period 3, to allow for cleaning between groups and give students time for labs that will make more time with social distancing? Uh, Santosh Mancala, are Chromebooks provided this year due to budget issues? Supriya Gan Ganager. Request for music, symphonic band, and PE achievable virtually as it was during the shutdown of school March through May. Donna Earl, as a high school teacher in our district, I much prefer high school model two for hybrid instruction. In this model, I will limit my exposure to approximately 90 students a day, four times a week, but model one proposes an exposure of approximately 180 students a day, four times a week. Both numbers are much lar larger than the three people actively in my home. I realize I am taking a risk returning to the classroom. I also realize the value of FaceTime instruction. Please agree with me to limit my daily risk. Harry Moquette, uh, whatever schedule is agreed to, it is essential for students who want to come back to the classroom that a plan is in place to accommodate those students with safety measures in mind. I feel it is essential to get students back in the classroom on at least some weekdays so they can have a real connection with teachers and teachers can connect with them and help them beyond virtual or distant means. Uh, Donna Earl, I've learned that many school districts are using al alphabetical division by last name when grouping students for return to school. I'm not sure if this is a board or district decision. As a high school teacher in our district, I am not confident that this method will reduce my class size by a period of 17 students. Over the years, I've had several examples of class periods where three-fourths of the students represented are one side of the alpha split. An alternative division method could be, uh, could be student ID number evens and odds for family members attending the same school exceptions could be made if this mess method creates family hardships. Mina Parmar, please consider all your options if high school has a block schedule. For safety reason, why doesn't 7-8 also have block schedules? Virginia Meager, uh, the presentation posted indicates sixth grade will be treated as elementary rather than middle school this year, and high school students will only be in each classroom one time per week. The online model expects five hours of parent interaction per a, ch per, per a child per day with three children at four, six, and high school levels. It is critical that we have a reasonable understanding of what the school's expectations are will be for the children being online and for parents supporting the learning at home in these hybrid models. The movement of sixth grade 
to an elementary model is also extremely disappointing for students who have been looking forward to middle school model and changing classes. We don't understand how this model came about or what it adds in terms of safety. We are pleased to see the co commitment to continuing music and special education. Durga Sanagana. As the COVID-19 cases are increasing day by day, I strongly feel that hybrid classes are highly risky for both kids and staff. Let's not take risk by introducing hybrid classes. Please don't, off please don't offer multiple patterns, which is leading to a lot of confusion to both students and parents. Please kindly go with the online classes for the first semester and revisit and decide the pattern for second semester based on the COVID situation at the time. Elizabeth Qtob. As a teacher at Mountain House High School and parents of students at Wickland, I have many concerns. First, I find it interesting that we closed when case numbers were much lower, but now are considering opening with cases much higher. The school board does not feel safe to meet in person, but are willing to send staff and students back to the classroom. This just doesn't seem right and doesn't make sense. I want to so badly be back in the classroom, but I don't feel safe doing so right now with numbers continuously rising. If we end up going back, I may have to take a, a leave of absence anyways, as my own children will need supervision during the, the times they're not in school. We do not have family around to help us out either. I have contemplated signing them up for LVLA, but can't if I'm at school every day. I can't uh, very well work all day and then come home to work with my own kids until midnight as their coach. When we took the survey of how many we wanted to return to school, I, I was unsure of my decision, as I know many were. If we were surveyed again, I'm confident many more would choose distance learning, myself included. I worry, especially for older students and all staff members who are likely to get COVID and spread it. What happens when I get sick? Does my classroom shut down? Do my own kids have to stay home too? What happens when one of my children's class, classes has to shut down due to someone getting COVID? And I also have to take time off uh, so that they have supervision when they're at home. Uh, there are brand new teachers with minimal sick days and are very concerned about those situations. Please, when you make you are making your decision, consider the safety and health of all students and staff members and the ramifications uh, those decisions have. Thank you for your time. Cynthia Fitzgerald. Tracy, Mountain House's direct neighbor, has more cases of, with a smaller population than Fremont and Fremont School District is going to distance learning. Distance learning seems to be the safest option given the surge of cases in San Joaquin County. Alyssa Frazier. For families with child care issues, it seems it would be best to have alternate day schedules versus AM PM. It is easier for families to make arrangements to get their children to from school at a regular school times if they work outside the area then in the middle of the day. It also opens the option for them to find full day care for their children in areas closer to their place of employment in addition to options here in Mountain House. Being an educator myself, I foresee the AMPM schedule will lead to attendance, tardy issues for students who are needing to manage getting themselves to school, especially the PM group. Sue Twistleman. Good evening, and thank you for hearing my comment on the opening of our schools. Personally, I do not believe that we should be even considering returning to school when the number of new COVID cases diagnosed in our country is three to four times higher than it was in March when we first switched to distance learning. However, since I cannot afford a leave of absence and would rather leave positions with LVLA to my colleagues with health complications that leave them more vulnerable to this disease, and to those colleagues who have small children of their own to care for, I would like to weigh in on the in-person education models. I realize that the teachers are closely divided in their support of the AMPM model and the AB model. As a primary teacher having to choose between these two options, I feel it is far more beneficial for my students to see me every day to receive their core instruction in classes with the AMPM model. With the AMPM model, students will actually receive more of my time and support instead of having to rely on their instructional coach for their in or core instruction on home days. With the AMPM model, the portion of the student's day at home can be spent practicing the skills they've just learned with me and completing their iRead and ST math. Then I will see them the very next day and be able to provide feedback before moving on to new skills. With the AMPM, I'm sorry, with the AB model, my young students will be forced to attempt many new skills with limited or no initial core instruction for me, from me. Their second uh, day in class will possibly be spent undoing the mislearning they did without my support before I can move on to any new core instruction. Also, 
As far as exposure is concerned, even though we will be in our classrooms with 12 to 16 students at a time, it is safer to spend three hours with them than seven hours. In addition to these instructional benefits of the AMPM model, it was lo logistical advantages over the AB model in that there will be fewer recesses and lunch periods to try to schedule and work out to keep students physically distanced. Getting these schedules is difficult enough task when we are not working with the dangers of a pandemic. I appreciate your time and consideration of what I had to say. Thank you, Sue Twizzleman, Wickland, second grade teacher. Uh, Michael Ward. Good evening, board members, Dr. Nicholas, fellow parents. My son is a student at Wickland. My work recently has been surrounding, has been surrounding mitigation risk for 30,000 employees across the country. Like you, I've spent the past four months reviewing the data to help lay out lay plans to return to the workplace safely. This experience has taught me that when it comes down to it, we have to put the safety of our employees first. The best way we can do this is minimizing contact and increasing frequency of cleaning. In my opinion, in evaluating the reopening options, going all virtual would be the safest option for everyone. However, of the two in-person models, Model 1 mitigates the risk while still giving students access to quality daily instruction from their teacher. The thing I fear the most about students and teachers being back in the classroom is based off of my professional learning. We learned that we weren't ready for a full reopening because our best laid plans frankly didn't work. We cannot overcome what we do not know. Is, is it really worth the risking the lives of children and the teachers to start the new school year in person because society says we need to? As leaders, we must make the right decisions and our guiding star is safety. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration of all points made tonight before your vote later this week. Christina Ramos, I have two daughters attending Mountain House High School. I am still trying to decide if we will go hybrid or full distance learning. I would feel a little more comfortable with hybrid if it was option B two days a week. Limiting class size is important, but I believe also in limit, it is limiting potential exposure. I believe that kids in the same family were all, at all possible should be placed in the same group schedule to help families with scheduling and transportation. I also think beginning school in a month seems really premature given that the pandemic seems to be exploding. I realize that we are in unprecedented times. Uh, thank you for your hard work and attention to my comment. Uh, Amanda Cornea. After reviewing the AMPM hybrid model and the AB block hybrids model with two days of school and three days off, I'm really hoping the board votes for the AMPM model where our children will be attending school four to five days a week. Not only is the consistency and routine good for our students, it also allows our teachers to really hone in on identifying each child's strengths and weaknesses through small group setting with under 15 students per class. This is an ideal situation for, teach, for our teachers to use best practices such as small group instruction, daily interventions to meet each child's needs. It has been proven that small class sizes improving learning so, that, so we need to look at this as an opportunity to better our schools and learning environments for our students and teachers. Additionally, the AMPM model would allow children to eat lunch at home, which would alleviate the stress of figuring out what to do during those lunch hours. Schools wouldn't need to organize how to keep the children distance from one another in either the multi-purpose rooms or classrooms. Children needing additional services in the form of resource, speech, occupational therapy, and, and others might have more opportunities to meet the, their, with their service providers either before or after their AMPM session. This would allow for more time spent inside the classroom learning content material so they can use the second half of their day focusing on other skills. I believe LUSD has an incredible opportunity here to create a hybrid model with smaller class sizes while keeping a daily routine for our parents, teachers, and students. Stephanie Lareda, if the only two options being considered at this point for us to choose are from a hybrid classroom distance arrangement or a fully distance arrangement, I urge you to make sure that model one for TK6 in which students attend either AM or PM daily is the model selected for the hybrid option. This model allows the best continuity of learning for students and allows teachers to provide instruction daily enhanced by students doing the independent learning portion of their work at home the other half of the day. It also allows working parents to consistently early a, uh, I'm sorry, it also allows working parents to consistently early a living working daily while their children are at school. 
I would also request uh, and point out that it's vital for siblings to be placed on the same schedule all a.m. or all p.m. together to maintain the best balance for the family learning environment. I would love to see, oh, I'm sorry, that was uh, Casey Taylor. I would love to see up open with distance learning. It would keep the students and teachers safe. Every district around us is doing this. Uh, then Kat Dabara. Huh? No? Um, where, where are the CDC guidelines on reopening school for physical distance? Uh, what's the thought process between Model 1 and Model 2? How does it make a difference in attending four days versus every alternate day? Gina Habib, does each group of students, whether it's going to be AM or PM, parenthesis, what times are going to be, parentheses, or the other model each other day going to be in different classes? And does the classes going to be sanitized? Or also, are they going to have different teachers for each group? Uh, thanks for all of the hard, all of your hard work to keep it, our kids safe. Sorry, so many questions. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask the rest of the board. We are at the 20 minute mark. I would like to go on until 7:30 with Dr. Nicholas reading the uh, public comments. Is everyone else good with that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Yep, that's fine. All right. Thank you. Continue, Dr. Nicholas. Uh, Divya Taruchinapali, and, and this one's a quick one, Model 1. Um, uh, Maria Bess Becerra, I choose Model 1. I think it's the best for kids. I have two kids, and having them go only half a day would be great. That way they will be able to go to school and not be and not have to be seven hours with the mask on. I think for the kids' mental health, it's best to go with Model 1. The kids need to get out of the house and uh, leave for a couple hours and uh, be a little normal interaction with other kids. Amel Muhammad, if, number one, if children return to school or a child or a teacher has COVID with the whole class and the families have to do a 14-day self-isolation, two, has the district considered pushing the start date back after Labor Day to see how things play out? Andy Sue, with regards to schools opening, while most of us want kids, parenthesis, I have three, parenthesis, to get back to normal, we are not out of the pandemic yet, and going back to normal means potentially losing a large number of kids, teachers, and staff to COVID-19. 0.5% of 300,000 teachers is 1,500. That's just in California. And that's not including the other school staff and kids. And... We also do not usually consider the possible permanent damage or disabilities from COVID-19 infections, which is still relatively unknown. The proposed measures from the state are not sufficient to protect everyone in the school environment. Ask Governor Newsom or Superintendent Thurman to come and sit with a COVID-19 patient for seven hours in the same room just six feet away. Yes, they can wear uh, a cloth mask and take the mask off when they are eating and drinking. If it's safe enough for our kids and teachers, it should be safe enough for, for them. And I get it, distance or virtual learning may hurt kids, but most kids are pretty resilient and permanent lung damage or, or a lost parent slash grandparent hurts the kids too. Distance learning also doesn't mean kids can't get some social interaction outside of school. At this point, I believe distance learning is the only way to prevent the spread of the disease when it comes to kids and school. Let kids play sports that are low risk parenthesis, tennis, golf, baseball, softball, swimming, et cetera, parenthesis, as long as appropriate precautions are put in, they need the activity. Rianne Lemire, this option allows me, oh, it says option two, this option allows me to work in my office for the Army at least twice a week, where half days would make it difficult. Insia Mohammed, for Model 1, my concern would be, to, would be the sanitization part, Will the school make sure that to sanitize everything before the PM batch becomes in? Do we have enough staff and funds to carry out the cleaning? For Model 2, there's a lack of continuity and requires a lot more planning for teachers, especially for days when kids are not in school. Christy Vasquez, Model 1, will most likely work best for the families in our community. My kids personally struggled with online learning. The more time in class, the better. Anita Moreland, AM. 
Don Evangelista, I think that model one works for TK6, model two works for seven, eight. April Wagner, I much rather use model two. I think it is logical and safest choice with less exposure to the kids because it's less time in the classroom. I would also hope that since I have multiple children that they could all be on the same A-B schedule at the school to make it easier. Less exposure equals, um, equals safer for all. I also don't see how it's expected to put a teacher in, a, in the position to disinfect the entire classroom in a, in a possible 30-minute break in between Model 1. Uh, how is that safe? The A kids come in, everything will need to be disinfected for the B group. You don't have enough custodians to handle that, so it falls on the teachers so to quickly do that, yet COVID can stand in the air for a given amount of time. Will new filtration systems be put in? How will a teacher clean in between students that quickly and confidently that all the surfaces and rugs, et cetera, are clean? He, she can't. Pickups and drop-offs would also go much smoother with Model 2, less kids each day. To be honest, two days on with Wednesday being a cleaning day, two days in a row, like all the other districts are doing, is the best. Cases and hospitalizations are ramping up, and we need to take this very seriously. I would love nothing more than to send my kids to school, but it's not safe. Safety should come above all else right now with the kids, and Model 2 would be the better solution to ensure some of that. Jennifer... Uh, Zakagni. Zac Brentwood and Santa Clara have both opted for distance learning to start off school year. I prefer hybrid but don't want to risk my family. The kids' are, cases are increasing. I'm a pediatric RN at Stanford. We are increasing. I don't want to commit to a year of distance learning either. Um, can we start off as distance, watch the numbers, and have more time to come up with a safe plan for everyone without being locked? into a full year of online. Samantha Mello, model one for TK6 would, do, would be best for student learning. It would also be better since students would be able to see their teacher every day. Going daily also helps with the social interaction that the younger kids are needing. Amel Muhammad, I prefer model one for the school year. Jeremy Lemire, how do working parents make this work? I also think making young kids wear masks is not in everyone's best interest. Igna Housley. Concerning return options for children going to school, even though I see the benefits of children going to, to school half days for four days straight, I believe it is not the safest option with people dropping off, picking up four times a day, as well as the amount of cleaning required in between. I heard about a two-day hybrid option with students to go two full days in a row and the other half goes two days in a row following. This allows for time to deep clean in between the two groups and gives longer time with teacher and child to learn and cover testing, etc. I am a full supporter of some kind of hybrid option and not 100% online for our family. Thank you. Uh, Chanta Burgess. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. Um, I'd just like to reiterate what I said at the outset of public comment that the board has received all these public comments and they will all be added to the minutes of the this board meeting so that everyone can see all the the um, public comments that were were sent to the board. And I believe Dr. Nicholas had something to say at this time so just to be clear would you would like me to um to move to the next part of the agenda and that the rest of this is being posted um i was i was um slightly distracted yes, yes. okay Mo moving on to action item five okay um so the purpose of this meeting or at least my intention here is to give a a, a a sense of purpose and function for this meeting. Um, but before I go into my uh, short comments here and before we turn over uh, to a PowerPoint presentation specific to the hybrid uh, models, uh, there's a number of things I'd like to kind of go over. The first thing I'd like to say, and I think it was reflected in um, the, the, uh, the comments uh, that were read this evening, is uh, this community is a very positive group of people. Um, 
And with the rare exception, um, our staff has been treated well uh, with good questions and um, it is appreciated. We appreciate everybody's thoughts um, on this matter. It is very complicated. Um, we are uh, comparing this to, uh, to the act of trying to thread the needle on the head of a pin. Um, there are a lot of challenges uh, uh, which we're trying to address. And the first one I'd like to share with uh, the community is, um, as a governing agency, uh, we answer to a number of different entities. Um, the governor, the state legislature, California Public Health, San Joaquin Public Health, and the San Joaquin County Office of Education. And as a, a member of a large functioning institution like uh, K-12 education in California, we are at the lower end of the totem pole um, or the hierarchical structure. And so um, over the past months, we have received significant direction from all of those entities. And each time we get or receive direction, um, we are often moving in a new direction. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, this idea that change is inevitable and that change is going to continually to consistently be asked of all of us um, until the uh, virus is under control. But I also think it's important to validate the frustrations that people are feeling individually um, on their personal life as an individual with their family and friends as members of the community, their concerns for our, our school district and our teachers and our staff. Um, this is a, a, a significantly challenging situation and everyone is feeling stress and anxiety and frustration. Um, so it's important that we keep saying that change is happening, um, but I, we want you to understand that if the governor tells us we have to do something different, we have to do it. Um, if California Public Health tells us we have to do something different, we have to do it. So. Um, a press release was uh, sent out tonight, and I'm going to re 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 uh, read it. Um, and this came from our public health officer from San Joaquin County in partnership with Jamie Musilamis, uh, superintendent of schools for a county office of education. The public health officer is named Dr. Maggie Park, um, and she has been unbelievably supportive of public education in her role. The title is, of the press release is, Public Health Officer and Superintendent of Schools Recommend San Joaquin County Schools Start New School Year with 100% Distance Learning. So here are the details of the press release. Due to the rise in confirmed cases of COVID-19 and increased hospitalizations in San Joaquin County, San Joaquin County Public Health Officer Dr. Maggie Park and San Joaquin County Superintendent of Schools James Mosalamis strongly recommend that local schools begin this school year providing only distance learning instruction through at least the end of August 2020. Dr. Park and Superintendent Mosalamis released the following joint statement, and that was released at 6 o'clock tonight. So just a little over an hour and a half ago. Back in March, school districts in San Joaquin County joined those across the state making the difficult decision to close campuses to slow the spread of the no novel coronavirus, which causes COVID-19. At first, the efforts to flatten the curve showed promising results. But today, the numbers show a surge in confirmed COVID-19 cases that has created a situation that is worse than it was on March 13. When San Joaquin County schools were recommended to close, currently the number of positive COVID-19 cases in San Joaquin County has risen to 6,988, and the ICUs in our seven area hospitals are at a 121% capacity. Children younger than 18 years old account for 642 of the positive case count. Understanding the virus and its local community spread is essential when deciding when and how to reopen schools for the next school year. It is for that reason that we are strongly recommending that schools and districts begin 2020-21 school year on a 100% distance learning model at least through the end of August. We, meaning public health and the SJCOE, we will review this recommendation in mid-August to determine if the situation has approved enough for schools to begin offer to offer 
a modified form of in-person instruction in September. Until then, districts and schools should focus their resources, training, and expertise in providing the best quality distance learning education possible for all students. This week, we, all, we will also work together to amend the San Joaquin County guideline, our guidance document for schools, the 2020-2021 school year planning, a guide to address the challenges of COVID-19. Education is the essential service in our community and it remains our firm belief that our children are best served by a return to, to as much in-person instruction as possible. Beyond the increased educational opportunities that come with being physically in a classroom, children also learn social emotional skills and receive other supports and benefits from being at school. However, any return to in-person instruction must be guided by the evolving scientific understanding of COVID-19 and the facts of its spread in San Joaquin County. This is why it is important that our school leaders and health experts continue to work together to provide the health and safety of students, staff, and all of our communities. And again, um, this was released this evening at 6 p.m. Now, why is that important? It is uh, important for a lot of reasons. Um, it is the first uh, direct um, instruction that we've received from our county officers um, in some time. But it's also important um, when you're talking about Senate Bill 98. So just a quick review. There was a May revise in the, in the governor's budget uh, it, it, to his budget proposal from January. Um, that started in May, and there was a negotiation between the state legislature and the governor. That concluded on June 30th. Um, on uh, Senate Bill 98 was signed in on June 30 as well, and in it it's called trailer bill language, and in it they set down the rules for what we could and could not do and the consequences for following the rules and what we needed to do to secure funding. So they tied following the rules in Senate Bill 98 to our funding. So in order for um, all the considerations to be done on all of these models, um, distance learning models had to have some connection to a public health officer direction. Um, tonight at 6 o'clock, that direction did come out, as I just read. So... We are trying to do, do this as smart as possible. And uh, two weeks ago, um, I talked about uh, following the old parable of the tortoise wins the race and the tortoise and the hare. Um, prudence, methodical movement, making decisions, keeping track of all the entities that are giving us direction as a government agency. And in turn, we're trying to protect the short and long-term interests of our district. When the COVID crisis ends, we will be here. And we need to make sure that our short-term interests of safety for our students, staff, and teachers, and the educational needs for our students are considered. So um, what we're asking for tonight is twofold uh, from the board. Uh, one is to get board direction, and I'll speak specifically to the um, press release statement and direction from County Public Health Official Dr. Maggie Park and San Joaquin County Superintendents of Schools Musulamus in that um, it is our staff's recommendation um, that we follow their recommendation and district learning should be the start of the school year through the end of August. Um, that would allow us two additional weeks, a little bit more than two weeks because school starts on August 13th to continue to test hybrid models that are being to be presented tonight um, and give us a little more time um, to Cross all the T's and dots, all the I's. Now, the purpose of the action item presented is that we are asking for board direction to build two hybrid programs, one for K-8, a single one for K-8, and a single one for the high school. Um, and irrespective of the fact that whether it starts on August 13th or September 1st, or there's a delay in action and it gets kicked out, uh, it is our recommendation as staff that we need to have a hybrid model regardless. And so uh, Mr. Harrison in a short time is going to give a presentation uh, with models for consideration and discussion. Um, additionally, uh, committees have been formed 
um, we are still gathering all the names so that when a model for hybrid is put to task by the board, that we will have groups of people, teachers and staff included, to look at all of the sides of logistics in one committee and curriculum and instructional issues in the other so that we can fine tooth comb it and um, use the, the best minds of our, uh, our staff as well. Um, it is also important uh, that people know that uh, with this new directive, uh, or, or at least what I'll say is the press release strong recommendation, um, is that we let the community know that we have been working to expand our child care providers contacts for families um, uh, out in the community. So we currently work with three daycare providers under contract. Um, we have reached out to all of them. Multiple uh, providers are willing to expand access. So whether distance learning or hybrid, if there's a need in the community, we believe that we're going to be able to uh, provide to families who need it additional access to daycare. We are also working, um, which is a little bit more complicated, but we are working uh, to provide assistance to teachers who will be on site teaching and staff who will be on site working who may have their own child care needs and to be able to provide a supervised uh, child care uh, distance learning, we'll call it academy, um, for, for in our staff. Um, that has to go through a, a number of steps, but it's been positively received by the officials that we would run that through. So I want people to know that all of these balls are moving at one time. Um, and then the, the, the last thing I want to do is, uh, and it, it's real important, is to talk about some of the rumors that we're hearing about. And um, some very kind people have written um, uh, uh, emails about, hey, I'm, I'm hearing this. Is this really true? Uh, the first thing I want to say is, is um, as well-intended as someone's neighbor or community member might be, the best thing to do if you have a question about what's going on in the district is to call the district office, and we will hook you up with one of our uh, leads who can answer your questions. Um, all staff are included in, in the meetings and information, and that would be the most accurate way to avoid people um, sending out information that causes family angst or people's concerns. I will give you an example. One of the rumors that started around was, um, in the case that a, a child may have to be moved this school year due to a COVID-related balancing need, um, the rumor was that that child will never be able to return to their village school, their home school, their neighborhood school. That's just, just patently false. But it was uh, being circulated out there, and it was causing people stress. Um, it, those are the kind of things we need you to call us so that we can answer your questions. I will also say and reiterate what, what um, President Pombo said earlier, which is that uh, FAQs are being uh, created. Uh, the questions in tonight's uh, uh, public comment are going to, uh, staff has already been directed to go through it and put together and answer questions for individuals, um, and, but we'll also put together documents that will help people with this as well. Um, so uh, the last note I'll say is this, and then Mr. Harrison's going to come up and speak, is that... Um, we really want to get back to normal like everybody else, too. And um, we received some exciting news uh, that reminded us of what uh, COVID-19 has taken from us. And I wanted to uh, uh, bring it up because it can get lost while we're all dealing with these uh, stressors. And that is um, the U.S. News and Reports is the one of the highest rated and reputed uh, ranking agencies in the uh, country. They rank schools, universities, um, uh, hospitals, uh, and big organizations like that. Um, and I was, I'm proud to announce that um, uh, Mountain House High School has been named one of the top 10% high schools in the country and also a top 10% high school in our state of California. Um, so we want to get back to normal with everyone else, and we hope that there's some kind of a, a solution to this as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, but I wanted to end my statements with that positive note so we can all be reminded of all the good stuff uh, that we're waiting to get back to. Um, and with that, Mr. A woo -hoo for Mountain House High School. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> yes, woohoo. So I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Harrison, who's Thank going you, Dr. to. Thank Nicholas. I had a. Oh, yes, sir. Question. 
for you and i'd also like to make a brief comment and allow the rest of the board to comment on what you've said as well before we move on to associate superintendent harrison um one thing i would like to ask or make sure that that press release will be included in the meeting minutes for tonight's meeting yes thank you um i'd also like to say that i for one was um quite relieved when when that press release came out i feel like it's the the right move for our district and for our county with everything that's that's going on and with that press release it relieved some of the angst that the board would have to deal with because if we made that move on our own we would um potentially jeopardize some funding in an already inadequate budget for our district. And so the fact that, that they gave us that, that uh, direction is, I think, quite, quite um, relieving, at least for myself. Would anyone else like to speak to anything that Dr. Nicholas said? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. You know, the, uh, the Senate bill, oh, I can't remember the number. You, you just mentioned it. So it said we would not be financially impacted if, and of course I'm paraphrasing, um, if the directive came from the county and county health. Well, this is coming from a recommendation. Does it hold the same amount of water that we would not be penalized? So the second we got this, we were on the phone with the county superintendent of schools, our attorney. Um, here's what we were told. County superintendent of schools um, uh, uh, received the AOK -okay from uh, uh, Mark Fine, a CEO from FICMAT. Um, our attorney said that this letter um, met the requirements of Senate Bill 98. Uh, he also said that um, there is some kind of auditing guidelines uh, that are being produced that um, auditors who audit our books um, will have questions. Uh, they could uh, raise a flag, but in terms of specific to SB 98, um, that's what we were told by our attorney and uh, county superintendent of schools. And I Thank spoke you. with him directly. I, I would just like to clarify something that, that I said a moment ago, and that was that this was a um, relief to me, but the, the fact that we may have been in line to lose some funding would not have swayed my, my vote or my opinion on this, on this matter. It just, it's a relief that it won't. Um, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to echo what uh, President Pombo said and and kind of you know expand upon that and and point out um, that the last time that we met and had a discussion of you know the upcoming beginning year was on the agenda where we could actually discuss it um, it was June seventeenth about a, a month ago and in that meeting we specifically acknowledged that it was unclear what impact the reopening of the economy and other factors we're gonna have on COVID-19 incident rate. And as a result, we reaffirmed the consensus that even though it was unclear when it would be deemed safe for students, teachers, and staff to return to school, the district still needed to move forward with the development of what that process would look like. The date that that occurs doesn't change the fact that we still have to be looking at how that process will unfold could have been beginning of the school year, could be September 1, could be December 1, could be January. Um, I was cautiously optimistic that, you know, with social distancing and the use of masks and all of those things, that life would be better and that, that we would be able to have our children in class, learning in the classroom and safe. I, like, uh, like President Pombo, was you know, as a board member, we can't talk about this as a board until we're in an agendized meeting, but I was stressing about seeing the increase in incidence of COVID-19, looking at the prospect of making a decision that was potentially in a, in, out in front of, of the, uh, the county and state recommendations, but knowing that that was the way, you know, that I was gonna have to vote my conscience, right? So I too am great, re, greatly relieved to see that the County Department of Health has, you know, even though it was 6 p.m. today, 
They acknowledged the increase in COVID-19 cases in San Joaquin County and provided the guidance that I firmly believe is the right answer. And I would just like to call to attention, um, Trustee Balzarini appears to have left the meeting. It's not because he didn't, wasn't interested in the meeting or didn't want to participate in the meeting. He was um, attending the meeting from the firehouse. He's a fireman. And I would bet that he got a call and that's why his, he is no longer in attendance in this, in this meeting. And I hope he stays safe wherever he is. Uh, I'd just like to let the public know that despite the fact that I look like I'm crying desperately tears of uh, uh, just sadness that my allergies are acting up and so I'm having some trouble with my eye, but I am also uh, really heartened to hear that we're going to do that, uh, that the superintendent, Ms. Lemus, and uh, the public health director are making decisions that are beneficial to our, to the safety of our students and staff at this point so that we can uh, move forward and, and not, not worry about their health. I, I agree with my colleagues here on the board. It's, um, th these are strange times, but it's refreshing to hear that the whole county is going to go in the same direction. Um, we should not as a district, nor should any other district be expected to be making huge decisions like this um, on our own. If it's something different between uh, Lammersville and Tracy, and that would be even more confusing for the community that why is one thing right for one district and not the other. So I am glad that we are finally getting the, the direction. Um, I know many other counties are waiting for a similar direction and many have already gotten it. Uh, Trustee Balzarini, would you like to weigh in on the um, press release that came down from the county superintendent and, and uh, county health director? Yeah. Um... I think a lot of folks said it in their in their public comments, uh, especially the ones that I read. I mean, unprecedented times. Uh, there's a lot of unknown with COVID, and uh, I think it's absolutely the right decision at the right time. Um, we have a CDC liaison here at work, and that person has given us a lot of information. And they said that right now, if you look at what we're dealing with, five weeks ago it was Memorial Day, and there was a lot of uh, non-social distancing and which created issues. And if you look five to six weeks from 4th of July, that would be about the start of school. So they're anticipating another huge spike. I, I think this is the right decision um, and something that we need to continue to keep reevaluating, but uh, uh, right decision at the right time. Yeah. And I, I just want to say that all of us like like all of our teachers and all of our students and all of our families want nothing more than for all our kids to be back in school and things to be back to normal. But unfortunately, there are things that we have no control over that sometimes dictate what we have to, to do. And with that, I will turn it back over to Superintendent Nicholas to introduce Associate Superintendent Harrison. Mr. Harrison is going to uh, make a presentation. Um, it kind of encapsulates uh, some data that was collected and some uh, models um, for your information and discussion and direction. Thank you. Board President Pombo, trustees, thank you for having me tonight. Welcome. Okay, so tonight I'm talking to you about some model schedules for TK-8 and the high school. Uh, these models are uh, potential models for the opening of a hybrid model for our schools. The first slide, uh, as Dr. Nicholas mentioned, we use information and guidance from a number of agencies, which I've, I've listed here, and the assembly bills, which Dr. Nicholas mentioned in his presentation. 
Now often, um, these agencies provide us guidance, and then they update the guidance, and that guidance may continue or it may backslide depending on where we are with COVID-19. So the only constant is change we've discovered in the last three months. Uh, we've stepped forward, we've stepped back, we've stepped sideways, depending on what kind of guidance we've, we've received. And um, the management of the push and pull between the state and local agencies and the safe and appropriate delivery of education is what we are trying to maneuver through at this time. So we, you know, we have input from the County Public Health, San Joaquin County Office of Education, uh, gubernatorial, legislative orders, and then we have to address the needs of our community, our staff, and educating children and safety in this time. So what are some of the considerations? First and foremost, student safety, staff safety, and the community needs. We've looked at recommendations from federal, state, and county agencies. We've made sure that we're addressing the ongoing education of LUSD students. And we want to ensure that we have progress towards graduation and meeting of standard for our younger kids. So what's the timeline been? So in May and June, we, we collected data from stakeholders. We analyzed said data and planned a variety of instructional models. We've taken input from parent groups, bargaining groups, the board, the county, uh, county public health, CDE, et cetera. As you can see on the timeline on June 30th, our budget was agreed upon on the 30th. And in July, we're, it's time to make some decisions on some sort of implementation of a traditional model versus a hybrid model versus a LBLA or online high school model. Now the traditional model is no longer in play because that's not an acceptable model at this point. So we have multiple models. We have the traditional model, which is five days a week, regular program, full access, has a continuity of program, and public health is not allowing this model. The hybrid model, in-person model, it has a blend of in-person instruction and distance learning. There, there's synchronous and asynchronous learning. Now, what is that? Synchronous learning is obviously learning that is done live by a teacher or a video that is taped by a teacher and students access later. Asynchronous learning is learning that's been assigned by the teacher that students uh, work through on their own or at a different time. In the hybrid model, there's sustained teacher contact and school connection. Now it's not the five days a week like the traditional model, but there is sustained teacher contact. And in the hybrid models that we're presenting tonight, there's structured intervention time for those students most at risk. Now, when you talk about a distance or a virtual learning model, virtual learning model being the high school online model or the LVLA model, teaching is obviously virtual. It can be synchronous and asynchronous. And when you talk about the LVLA model, we're looking at a one-year commitment with a potential reevaluation at the mid-year, depending on where we are with um, the health and safety factors that go into these models. So let's look at some of the data that we've gathered to make some decisions. The K-8 model study, which had 3,321 3, 3, total surveys taken, shows 68% of, re of respondents elected their student to be in a traditional or hybrid model. Now, the number of electees for LVLA were 1,364 um, parents, at, or 41%. Now, we'll break out those numbers and give you some actual numbers in a later slide. Same survey for the high school, the model study survey, uh, with 1,005 participants. You'll see that 73% of respondents elected their student to attend traditional or a hybrid model. You'll note that the request for online was 272 students, or 27%. And I just want to make some comments on that while we're on this slide. There are 97 students to date that have applied for the online virtual at the high school, and 90 of those signed up this last week. 
The other thing I want to point out about this model, this online model at the high school, is that some AP classes some C and some CTE classes are not available in that model. So we'll do it distance learning. Correct. So when you're talking about a distance learning model, the distance learning model, you will have some of those classes available. So this is the K-8 actual applications for LVLA by grade. You can see the breakdown. It's uh, pretty consistent by grade level. And this was as of today at 2.30 p.m. This number is, uh, has changed rapidly this week. This graphic and the numbers on this graphic have been key for staff for scheduling uh, to make decisions on how the scheduling would work for LVLA and how the scheduling would work back at the home school where students are coming from. And this is the breakout by school. So we can see how many applicants for LV LVLA by school site. Now the one thing I want to point out here, the Hansen numbers could be a little skewed by Cordis parents indicating that they're still a Hanson student when they may be going to Cordis for this coming school year. This snapshot uh, also shows the pre-enrolled students and um, the pre-enrolled students are in the system uh, but they're not yet placed in the school. This is our survey for uh, special ed students and their preference for returning to school in the 2021 school year. 47% selected virtual learning, while 53% selected in-person learning for their students. This was a key slide for us early on because we had some concerns about uh, whether families could uh, provide assistance to their students while doing distance learning and provide pickup and drop off for their students in a hybrid model. Um, and this shows the parent concern or not concern when it comes to having an adult at home to A, supervise the child or B, help the child with some sort of distance learning. You'll note that there's an approximate two to one ratio of not concern to concern. We also uh, surveyed our LTA unit members to, talk, uh, to ask questions about returning to work. We had a 90% response rate for our teachers, and you'll note that 151 teachers prefer to return to full traditional instruction, while 63 prefer to participate in virtual learning, 19 had no preference, and 13 had a pre-existing condition that would uh, limit their ability to teach. Now this last group, um, that number's moved to 18 at this point. It, it's changed in the, in the recent days. And uh, that individual group would have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with HR where they would talk about HR 6201 and the interactive process. We also polled our CSEA members with similar questions. We had a 74% response rate for CSEA and uh, 81 prefer to return to full traditional school, while 23 prefer to participate in distance learning virtual academy support, um, while three have pre-existing conditions and 21 had no preference. Once again, that third group would uh, get an individual meeting with, with human resources. This is the classification of the CSEA members that took the survey, just so you're aware, classified, classified confidential, classified management, and did not specify when they took the survey. So what are our considerations? Safety considerations are, are key. We had a PPE group that I think I've talked to the board about before. That's a personal protective equipment group, which we brought together to talk about the purchase of protective equipment, what protective equipment we need to purchase, the volume of hand sanitizer and uh, rags and cleanser we need to buy, how we're going to ship it, where we're going to ship it to, and how we're going to divvy it up to the school sites. Um, we have talked about 
office security and what kind of space the office will be moving forward. That PPE group is going to shift into the logistics group that Dr. Nicholas mentioned earlier. The logistics group will be in charge of looking at the safety of the campus when it comes to cleaning, hygiene, and logistics going on and off the campus. We also looked at social distancing and hand hygiene. Those are key factors. Entrance and exit to campus, office safety and visitors, the limitation of visitors. Will visitors have to wear a mask when they come into the office? What kind of safety provisions we will take in the office, such as plastic barriers and things like that. The cleaning of every classroom, hand sanitizer in every classroom, the sanitization of every classroom every single day, strategic lunch and recess assignments to allow us to have more time to clean classrooms, but also to allow for a safer recess and a safer lunch for our students and our staff. We also uh, are talking about and are concerned about structural barriers for our lower grade students uh, because some of the literature that we've been given suggests that lower grade students in TK, K, and 1 and 2 may not be effective to use a mask and may not even be able to keep a mask on during the day. So we've looked into structural barriers that are see-through for the kids in the lower grades. So as we talk about different models for school and the safety of our students, an AB model that splits the student population in half is fairly effective. An AB model is a combination of face-to-face -face instruction and distance learning. The students are grouped into an A and a B set of students. They may attend a morning or an afternoon session or assigned alternating days. So the AB schedule allows for less contact time while maintaining, while maintaining some school structure and some regular school attendance. The structure allows for additional time for, for special ed students, 504, and ELD services, services for our students as needed. So the first model that I'd like to talk about and give you the structure of is a TK6 Model 1. Now before I start talking about Model 1, I want to tell you that the Model 1 for TK6, the Model 1 for 7-8, and the Model 1 for the high school all have a similar structure. So when I talk about structure and function, and I talk about pros and cons, you'll find the similar pros and cons and similar um, uh, structural details for all the Model 1s. So the TK6 Model 1, student would, uh, students would be broken into two groups, an A group and a B group. The A group would attend in the AM, they would have lunch, and that lunch would be a grab-and-go lunch, and parents would come pick up the students and take the students home after the A session is finished. B students would then be dropped off at school. They would go straight to lunch, have lunch, and then potentially have a recess right after lunch. And then they would go to class and attend classes. Now, the, re the reason for that time span in the middle of the A and B group is so that we can have a full cleaning of all the classrooms during that time that the students transfer from the A group to the B group. On Friday, you'll notice it says intervention and prep. So the idea for this model is initially it provides some prep time for teachers to, to prep their lessons, but it also provides some intensive intervention time for students in greatest need. It's time that uh, special ed students or speech students can get some intensive time with their teacher. It's a time where teachers can call students into their classroom individually or in some very small groups and provide intervention for either an A group or a B group student. It is also a time for additional cleaning on the school sites. So what are some of the pros? So some of the pros for this model, students meet more frequently. There's more consistent time with teachers four days a week. Students leave in-person learning, live learning four days a week. Now note that the A group would have live learning during the A time, and during the B time, that would be time that they'd be working on asynchronous learning from, that has been assigned to them by their teacher. The same would be true for a B student who goes in the afternoon. In the morning, the B student would be working on their work during the A time to complete work to be handed in or prepared for school during B time. Some of the cons, shorter learning time each day, uh, tradition, transition during drop-off 
and lunch, that's, that transition time might be a little challenging for pickup and drop off. And now I'm gonna move on to the next model. Model two is a A-B day schedule. And this schedule, the A group of students would come on Monday, the B group on Tuesday, A group on Wednesday, B group on Thursday. We'd still have the intervention or prep day on Friday for intensive intervention and prep for teachers. Now the pros for this model is there's longer classroom time in the day, so there's more continuity throughout the full day of instruction. It's more like the regular school day where the, the student attends for the full day, so it seems like a regular school day. Now, once again, they're A and B group students, so the school is split in half. So there's less contact time and there's less students on campus at a given time. Some of the cons are you'll have full days of the students doing uh, distance learning at home. Uh, students would only attend two days of the week, but the amount of time that students are attending is about equivalent. Model one to model two, they're attending still about the same amount of time overall. One is two days and one is four days of time. That is the TK6 models. The 7-8 model is similar. Model one is similar to the TK6 model, except I broke it out into periods. Now, um, some of our school sites have a rotating schedule with periods in the 7-8 uh, portion of the day. And then some of our schools have a self-contained classroom as, uh, uh, model as well. So I put this up here as a period model, but it can be uh, viewed as self-contained as well for the A time and the B time. So the A time, period one, two, and three would occur on Monday, four, five, and six on Tuesday for the A group, then repeat Wednesday and Thursday. Once again, four days of class time uh, for the A group, and then B group in the afternoon, period one, two, and three, and that would repeat throughout the week through Thursday. So there would be th th four days of contact for the students each day. Once again, the lunch would occur in the middle of the day and cleaning of those classrooms would occur during that time. Now the release time for these students for lunch and the end of the day is a little different than other student time, thereby allowing us uh, staff to have cleaning time during that midday period of, of, of the schedule. And once again, Friday intervention would occur um, just like the K-6 model where teachers could call in students for intensive intervention, uh, ELD, or other services. Now, uh, Friday is also the day that we have early release. I didn't mention that on the K-6 model, but for K-12, their early release days are on Friday, and that's denoted on this model. The 7-8 model two is similar to the TK-6 model two, in that Monday would be the A group, Tuesday would be the B group. Uh, and then repeat A group, B group, and then the Friday intervention, early release day. You'll note that I did put lunch on the Friday intervention day. We are required to provide lunch for our students five days a week, and we'll have more uh, related to the delivery of lunch once we have a set plan for the models. Moving on to high school. The high school, um, Version one is similar to the middle school version one in that they have two periods of, of the day on Monday. A group would go first and second period, have lunch, take a, a grab and go lunch. And the B group would come have lunch and B period one and two would attend. And that would move on to Tuesday, which A group and B group would have third and fourth period. And then Thursday, fifth and sixth, and then Friday would be period seven and success period for those students that need extra help and support. There would still be a Wednesday intervention day. Wednesday day works for the high school because that's a day where they commonly have meetings um, at the end of the day or even shortened days. Now, what are the pros and cons of this high school uh, model one? Students attend four days a week is a pro, half day, one passing period per day, so there's less contact time for the students in this model than the second model. Um, and then one of the cons is the transition time at the middle, uh, similar to the, the K-6 and the 7-8 model, that transition time in the middle is gonna be a little challenging to manage. High school model two is the A-B day model. So high school students would go to school, uh, the A group would go 
Monday, period one, two, lunch, three, four. And then the B group would go period one, two, lunch, three, four, and repeat it on Thursday and Friday. So once again, like the K6 and the 7, 8 model, uh, the pros, it's more like a regular school day. Now, you'll note that these periods are a little longer. They'd be 90 minute periods, more of a block schedule. And, and this model, one of the pros is it's improved collaboration time for the teachers because they have collaboration time on two separate days of the week, where in the previous model, they have collaboration time only one day of the week. Now, some of the cons, there's an additional passing period with this model. So that's an additional opportunity for contact for students. And students attend two days a week, but the time is consistent with the first model. Uh, please give me a moment. I'm having some technical difficulties advancing the slide. Thank you, Associate Superintendent Harrison. Ah. Uh, we're almost done, but uh, the, the uh, PowerPoint is frozen and we're rebooting it. Oh. Second to last. All right. I was... 24. I was a little confused because of the, the pause. There it is. All right, we're back online. So model considerations, once again, first and foremost, safety. Second, the ability to social distance and have smaller cohort groups of students together and uh, uh, having less contact with as many students. Uh, time on campus and time on, in class, as Dr. Nicholas pointed out, is key uh, for student socialization, social emotional support. The, the direct instruction part versus the asynchronous distance learning part, both models have both direct instruction and distance learning. So there is some social interaction on campus with not only student peers, but with adults, um, with counselors, with individuals that can provide emotional support and academic support for our students. In this hybrid models, um, intervention is built in for the most at risk. And with these hybrid models, we have the ability to pivot. We can pivot forwards and backwards. If we uh, begin the school year with distance learning, we have the ability to pivot into this model fairly easily if we're asked to step our way into a traditional model. Um, and then vice versa, if we step into this model from distance learning and we're told that we have to close back down to distance learning, this is an easier model because the practice is there when it comes to the, district, the distance learning. And lastly, next steps, our focus groups are, are, are going to meet and, and get to work on their tasks. The Curriculum Instruction Committee and the Logistics Committee, as Dr. Nicholas mentioned previously. We're going to have to communicate with parents regularly, the community and staff, so that they know what is, um, what's coming and what safety precautions and how we are addressing the needs of students and safety at our school sites. We're going to communicate with local child care, as Dr. Nicholas already mentioned and collaborate with them in ways to help our families and our teachers and staff. And then we have some site prep preparing to do. When the sites come back to work, they're gonna have to have a site safety team at each school, which most of them already do when it comes to uh, safety for students and discipline. We're going to add some logistics information when it comes to COVID-19 to their site safety teams. Staff communications from the sites are going to be key and then school and community communications on what's happening at their individual school sites will have to come at that time as well. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Associate uh, Superintendent Harrison. Do we have questions or comments by the board? I do have a quick question for you. Um, I know that uh, typically the high school has their um, collaboration day and their shortened day on Wednesday and that the uh, K-8 schools have theirs on Fridays. Um, but with this new model that we're coming up with, would it be possible for those intervention days to be on the same day for the high school and the K-8 so that for parents it would be simpler um, as far as childcare or work schedules and things like that? I also think it's more productive for um, intense cleaning. Yes, that in the middle of the week. 
yes, that is a, a, a possibility and a structure that we have uh, discussed. Uh, the reason that it was presented in this fashion is that historically, the K-8 teachers have had their early release days on Friday, and I didn't want to tip the wagon over too far um, and change from Friday to Wednesday, which would change their week quite dramatically. In the parent comments, um, and I had not thought of this before uh, reading the comments from the parents, um, a few of them suggested that we do continuous days like Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday, instead of splitting it up. And just listening to the parents on that, I actually, I, I think that idea might have uh, quite a bit of validity to it. Had we thought of anything like that in our planning stages? Yeah, um, yes. Um, I apologize for chuckling because we've probably had about 27 or 30 different models on the board that we've I'm thrown sure. around and, and um, kicked around, thought about, erased, then rewrote. Yes, we did have that model on the board and, and at some point, um, but we removed it in favor of this model because it's a little more common in different school districts around the area than the back-to-back -back day model. I have a question on um, the way cleaning would be done between the two models presented. The model where you essentially have a morning segment and an afternoon segment. So model one, I guess, is what it is. Who is going to be doing the cleaning between the children and the students in, in uh, tranche A and the students in tranche B? So the cleaning in midday would be able to occur only in the K-6 and 7-8 model, not at the high school. The high school cleaning would happen at the end of the school day because there's too many classrooms to get done during that time period. The individuals that would be doing the cleaning would be our custodial staff. Now, there would have to be an adjustment to have a night custodian, one night custodian come up to day shift if that model was the model selected. And uh, our staff has indicated that with two individuals, they could get through the TK6 classrooms and the 7-8 classrooms during that mid-time transfer of students and hit every touch point in every classroom. So my, my visceral gut reaction, and I would ask the board to, to check me or correct me on this, is that um, having it where a group of students are there the whole day and then it's cleaned and another, either A, doing it on Monday and Tuesday so that the same students are coming back you know, after they've been there the day before and then you know, either it's Wednesday, you know, like Wednesday's the, the break day and then it's Thursday or Friday, it doesn't matter. But it seems to me having one group of students in the classroom um, for the whole day is safer than having one group of students in, they leave, we don't clean, and another group comes in in the afternoon. I'm not an expert on contact transmission, but it seems like eliminating that possibility would be a better alternative than not. I, I agree, Colin, and I also think that it would be easier to do contact tracing if we have one cohort um, at, at school all day so that if there's a problem, we can say, okay, that one cohort doesn't need to return. We don't have the possibility of exposure during drop off and pick up or other things if we've got all the kids on mixing around on the same campus at the same time. I, I agree with both of those concerns in that my fear is, is that we have all the kids on campus during that transition period. And I know that's not how it's designed, but a lot of kids are going to go to school and walk home after the morning session. And a lot of other kids are going to be walking to school before the afternoon session. And I can just see kids congregating during those times and mixing the, the cohorts where if, if one cohort goes all day on a given day, then the other kids aren't going to show up at school to mingle with them if they don't have to be at school that day. Yeah, I, I agree with the three of you. I think the, the full day is a better option for many different reasons of which um, the three of you have mentioned. I also think, you know, li listening to 
the parent comments to enable a parent to go to work for a full day um, mm -hmm. is also good for them rather than cutting them back and forth. I am very concerned about the transition period, those lunches, because as much as we can plan that group A will get out before group B arrives, it, you know, the best laid plans, it just never happens that clean. Yeah, unfortunately, I feel like the half day option is probably a better option for continuity and the uh, education side of it. But at, at this time, I think I feel like we need to give greater weight to the to the safety and, and cleanliness angle rather than the education part of it. It's it's unfortunate that we have to choose between the two, but that's that's my feeling. I think Sanhita was trying to say something. Yes. Yes, go ahead. And all of the hybrid yeah, and all of the hybrid models mentioned that the student population is going to be split in half. But like the parent comes mentioned that um, Tracy schools are doing it with less name. How exactly are we going to do it? I don't think we've addressed how it's going to be divided into A and B. Uh, Sharon? How the students fall into a certain cohort. And I did not hear what Sanita said. Can somebody paraphrase what she said? I, I have technical difficulties I couldn't hear. Um, I think Sanita, correct me if I'm wrong because your sound does, isn't coming across clearly. But what I heard was a question about how students would be divided into the A and B group. Do I have that right? Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. I, I think it's been discussed that, well, I'll let Associate Superintendent Harrison address that. So I think that would be a part of the role of the CNI group when we come together. Once we have the architecture of what our plan would look like, then we can fill in all the gaps of the the day-to-day -day planning, how we're going to choose students, uh, what um, collaboration will look like for the teachers, etc. So if I could, while I have the mic, so it sounds like option two is the option that um, the board is is most. Um, in, in interest of. Well, I'm gonna, I, I hate to go against the grain, but uh, based on everything that, that we do at work, it's all about uh, constant cleaning. And just based on what's been explained, it sounds like the first model, there's a lot more cleaning involved, which will create a more sanitary environment. I understand there's gonna be a transition of students, but I still think it's gonna be more sanitary if, if that's the discussion that we're having about what's what's more sanitary uh, on the campus. That's but just, we could uh, still, we could have that, that full day model with lunch and recess back to back, which would still enable us to get custodians into the classrooms during that break time. I know CSEA in some other districts um, has actually signed off on approval to hire temporary custodians to come in in the middle of the day and do that kind of cleaning. So I think it, I, we could come up with a model that would, um, that would address all the concerns with, with most of the board thinking about the all day model, but I agree with the cleaning, getting in there in the middle of the day is important as well. Then I have a follow-up question for Mr. Harrison. So based on what we've just been given, uh, we're gonna have to delay, it sounds like with the health, the direction of the health director. So do we have to make a decision on this now or is this something that can wait until we begin the school year? I, I know parents want to plan, but I really think that the survey has value and I don't think we got a good survey because people are looking at snapshot right now. I'm just wondering timeline, do we have time to do another survey as things progress or do we need to make a decision now? So we, um, we uh, set a deadline for the LVLA to the 24th to allow staff to start to uh, uh, staff the um, teachers and kids. Uh, so that would play a factor. And the other factor we were considering is how much time do parents need to start to adjust their, their daycare. So Mr. Harrison, uh, staffing basically two different districts within our district, the uh, online one and, and the... Uh, a hybrid option, uh, what, what's the timing on that? So 
The hybrid option, um, staffing it is going to be a challenge. As you saw the numbers by school site, we have to you know, um, move some students around. Uh, staffing the hybrid model with the LVL, LVLA model in place is going to take some time. So we were still looking for some guidance on a model so we could continue to plan and have that structure in place for if and when we are asked to step into a uh, model that has in instruction at school and at home, a hybrid model, because we do not believe that we're going to get uh, told that we can go from a distance learning model straight to tr traditional model. We feel like there's going to be a step in between. So I would like to have that model built, st the structure, teachers informed of who's going where and what, even if we're not starting with it at the beginning of the school year, just so we have a plan in place ready to plunk down in case we have to use it. I have a follow-up question. Um, some of the parents have already opted to put their students in the LVLA program, um, and you noted that that had increased um, due to concerns right now of the spike in coronavirus. I'm wondering if a parent, say, was very concerned, and so they opted to do the LVLA, and now they're hearing we're going to go into distance learning. Are those parents able to, to withdraw and choose to go into the hybrid later? Or once you're signed up for LVLA, you're stuck now. <laughs> I, I had a question like that uh, from a parent today, as a matter of fact. And uh, moving forward, if we move into distance learning, the LVLA enrollment would be delayed and the distance learning would still be uh, controlled by school site. So if I was a Wickland parent who had a student enrolled in LVLA, that enrollment would pause for the distance learning and then if we were going to roll into a hybrid slash LVLA model, that person would have the opportunity to be into LVLA once that model was uh, put into play. So the requirement, if I can ask a couple of questions um, on what you just said, Associate Superintendent, um, the deadline to apply for LVLA would essentially toll. So if the health yeah. department in August says up oh, September is remote learning, then the parents would have additional time to decide, you know, that they want to go to LVLA um, and they wouldn't be held to a deadline at the beginning of the year to decide yes or no. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? So, so yeah, so look at, look at LVLA as its own entity. And then we have a hybrid model that's on hold for distance learning uh, for the first two and a half weeks of school. If that gets extended out uh, beyond a month and it looks like it's a long-term deal, then the whole program, the distance learning thing has to be brought together um, because you can't have a distance learning program and an LVLA and no end in sight to uh, coming back to school full time. So if, if you would, if you see two houses, the first house is LVLA kind of moving forward. And the second house is um, kids that are want to be in person, but they're, we've delayed it. Then those kids would get distance learning. Does that, did that answer your question, Mr. Clements? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, my second question though, was I, I think it's possible that Trustee Balzarini heard something or noted something that I did not hear. And so I wanna circle back to the difference between the full day model and the part day model. Uh, Cause I can't, I think model one was part day and, my, and the second one was, was full day. I did not hear that there was more cleaning being done in either model over and above the other one. If it is, if, that is, if there is more cleaning in one, can somebody explain to me, uh, exactly what that means so on that part day um where you have a in the morning and b in the afternoon there were two lunch breaks in between for the a kids and the b kids during those lunch breaks the custodians would be in the classrooms cleaning because you have a new group of kids coming in on the all day model they wouldn't necessarily have to unless we set it up that way um, go in during lunch and clean because the same kids are coming back in the afternoon. Yeah. But I think we could address Trustee Balzarini's concern 
um, by having a lunch and a recess or something like that, and making sure the custodians do get into the classroom, even if it's the same kids all day. Monday is A kids all day long. Somebody should be cleaning those rooms um, during lunch break. So I asked a clarifying question as to who was going to be doing the cleaning, and I'm, I must have been smoking crack. I thought what I heard was nobody is cleaning in the middle of the day uh, when you've got a group of kids in the morning and a group of kids in the afternoon. Can you clarify that? Yes. So the, the A model, the, the, number, the one model for uh, kids attending, there would be a lunch, excuse me, a recess lunch lunch recess time of approximately 45 minutes to an hour that the campus would get cleaned between the A group coming onto campus and the B group coming onto campus. What Trustee Lampel said was exactly correct for that model. And uh, what we would have to do is move a night custodian up to day shift to have two bodies, two custodians available on the day shift to complete that cleaning during midday for the, the AB model, the AMPM AB model. Did I answer okay, your question? Thank you. I, I somehow heard 180 degree opposite when you when I asked the question and you provided an answer. I I'm with uh, Trustee Lampel that you know good is cleaning between two sets of students. Better is cleaning in the middle of one student and having uh, cleaning overnight before between one group of students and mm -hmm. a second group of students. And, and and I think possibly that could be addressed by touch point cleaning in the middle of the day versus deep cleaning at the end at of night. the day between, mm -hmm. between cohorts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this could actually mean that it, it could become a cost item because we might have to uh, hire some temporary custodians. And to, um, to go back to Trustee Balzarini's um, idea about having an additional survey if the um, comments, public comments that we received are an indication, the parents are basically split down the middle for whether they prefer A, B being morning and afternoon or every other day. So I'm not sure that a, an additional survey would get us a lot more, a lot more information. One concern that I heard out there, and I didn't think of it, somebody else did, but in the every other day scenario, we have a lot of Monday um, holidays. Would it would we be looking at having those kids come in on the Friday instead, or would that cohort just miss all those days of instruction? Good point. So that cohort would move. the The A B would skip to Tuesday. So if we had a Monday holiday, your Tuesday would be your A cohort group of students if you were doing the day model, right? Because that's the one that it affects the most. And during that week, you would have the four days of instruction and the intervention prep day would go away. Uh, you would still have to recognize the early release day on the Friday, but it would just be a protracted day on, on the schedule on that Friday like they would have in any other school day. That, the reason I ask is because, well, in addition to the kids missing that, if you change the day of the week after every holiday, then it makes it difficult for, for parents to say, well, this week yeah. my kids are, are in class on Tuesday and next mm -hmm. week they're in class on Wednesday and the following week they're, you know, if it, if it rotates like that. So that may be an issue for some, some families. Yeah. Uh, just so uh, the board's aware, once the, this model is prepared and set, we're obviously going to have to make some changes to our master calendar um, and uh, include, you know, whatever the Friday early release days are and the Wednesdays for the high school, et cetera, um, when we come back from distance learning. We have Monday is the intervention prep day. <laughs> I was gonna ask about that. <laughs> yep, that makes it but easy. These are things that, that would have to be negotiated with LTA because it, they, we have contract language to address a lot of these things. Are there further questions or comments by the board?
So um, just to check for understanding, it appears that based on that discussion, um, the the board's consensus is is option two um, is the 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 desired option framework. Um, and then um, in terms of high school, uh, the, is that also the board's um, desire is the option two as well? I think it, so. It would Correct. be my, my, my preference because I think it's well. even more, uh, more of an issue because you'd have all the kids on campus in the middle of the day in the morning afternoon scenario and you know, sweeping the campus of high school kids may prove to be as challenging as <laughs> some of the other things we're going to have to deal with. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. Model two is what I think for high school as well. I agree. So um, what I think was as, as a, the action item goes, I, I think we would need a um, motion uh, action as amended which includes direction uh, based on um, county public health to distance learn through the end of August and for district staff and the committees and, and everybody uh, is put to task on option two, both for the K TK-8 program and high school. Is, is that correct? I believe so. If we have someone that so wants moved. to fashion that. Yeah. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Is there any other further comment or questions by the board? Having a first and second, do we have a student preferential vote? Aye. Having a first and second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And I think all we have left is calendar which is wednesday july 15 2020 is the next virtual board meeting at 7 p.m at this time i would have normally had um discussion about resuming in-person board <laughs> meetings but with everything going on i think that's probably a back burner issue for now until until things settle down out there so is there anything else? All right, um, in just a minute, we're going to adjourn this meeting and we have no closed session items this evening, so. I'll thank move you. to adjourn. Thank you. I'll second. Student preferential vote. Thank you. Having a first and second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all. And thank you for everyone out there watching.